Hi everyone, it's Nono here. Today I want to share with you a video lecture delivered by Nate Peters at the Digital Futures Workshop that we organized with Jose Luis Garcia del Castillo back in June 2020. In this lecture, Nate is going to talk about his master's thesis that he did at the Harvard Graduate School of Design when he did a design technology master's degree. And he's going to discuss the methods that he used to develop an AI powered web application that produces architectural floor plans from user drawn shapes. Without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so quick about me, uh, my original undergraduate university studies were in architecture. So I had a bachelor's of architecture degree from Iowa State. Uh, towards the end, I sort of uh, jumped onto the, the computational design bandwagon. We uh, I just opened up a kind of robotics research lab my, my final year. So I pivoted and decided to not be an architect and go to grad school. Uh, I went straight from there to the GSD and I was a master of design studies tech student for two years. Uh, the project that I'll show here was my, my master's thesis. Uh, and then in the middle of that, I started at Autodesk as an intern. I think right as known I was starting full time. Um, and I think I was at least, there's like a weird kind of like orbit between the, the group we work in at Autodesk and the the schools in Boston. Um, but I was there as an intern, um, and then right after I graduated, I started uh, full-time, and I've been there ever since. So my, and before I dive into the, the research stuff, I'll give you just kind of a super quick overview of what uh, what I'm doing kind of day-to-day -day now. Uh, so I'm in a, a department at Autodesk called the Architecture, Engineering, Construction, Generative Design Group, um, which essentially says, you know, we're, we're building kind of new cutting edge tools for, for people in the AC industry, um, for workflow optimization, machine learning. Uh, the project that I've been working on started as uh, a beta called Project Refinery. Uh, and then just within the last uh, three or four months, we, uh, we've launched as kind of a rebranded, now actually a real product tool called Generative Design. Uh, so Revit's the first place that it's available. Uh, but essentially it's a, uh, it's a multi-objective optimization tool. I have a quick video I can show you guys. But the, the idea is that, you know, there's there's a large group of people now like us that have, you know, computational design skills and they go to Dynamo, go to Grasshopper. Uh, but there's still a large, uh, a large portion of architects and engineers that spend a lot of time in modeling software but don't have any engagement with design automation. So the kind of high level concept of generative design is the tool is you know, first building a platform that someone who understands automation and optimization, they have a way to kind of share that knowledge and share that work with other people that, that don't necessarily engage with it. And then the other major kind of goal of this is that if you have, you know, repetitive problems or uh, kind of small scale things that you do every day as a designer or an engineer that consistently require kind of reevaluation, um, but are at the same time automatable, it makes it easier to kind of bundle up these, these optimizable problems in a sense uh, and, and reuse them across projects and avoid kind of the fatigue of constantly managing Dynamo scripts and Grasshopper scripts and updating them from projects and having to manage them and kind of all the overhead that comes along with that. So this is uh, you know V1 or almost V0. This has only been out for a couple of months, but we're super excited about it. But that is not what we'll be talking about today. Um, so the thing I want to focus on for this section is a uh, project we did back at the GSD that was focused more on uh, machine learning and participatory design. So participatory design is essentially the, the process of design that actually engages the end user in the process. So with an architecture, you know, the person that's going to live in the house or use the space actually has some agency in determining that space. It's not a super common problem, you know, it's not a common way of, of engaging the design process normally because it's, it's complicated enough as it is. Uh, but the, the kind of overlap that I was interested in here was uh, proposed systems for mass housing that should have engaged with participatory design, but for whatever reason really didn't. Uh, and there's a really long and sort of interesting history of, you know, kind of like failed utopias, like failed mass housing projects. Um, you know, architects like, uh, Gropius and Franklin Wright and Yona Friedman and, and essentially everyone you can think of has, has had some sort of 
entry into this realm. Um, and they all have a lot of kind of shared overlaps. The most interested in um, kind of fall into separate categories. The one, oh, can you guys still hear me? I just got the, good, okay. Yeah, you froze for a moment, you're good got enough. the scary Zoom. Uh, okay, yeah, I got the, your internet is unstable pop up. Um, so what I was interested in first was the, the physical system that the Gropius designed. It was a, a panelized or kind of Lego-like adaptable architecture system that they actually manufactured for a few years, but built very few examples of. Uh, and the issue is that there was really no consideration given to how someone who isn't an architect would customize it, you know, for, for all the effort they put in and making it to be something that could be reconfigured and, and reused and sort of you know, freed from the bounds of traditional construction problems, they didn't account for the fact that you still only have so many architects and a much larger body of people that would, you know, need houses. Uh, and this is, you know, the 1940s, it's very, very far pre-computer, but it's, it's interesting because the, the efforts in this realm really haven't changed even in close to 100 years now that, you know, the prefabricated house still sort of looks the same. The second project I looked at for a long time was by Jana Friedman. Um, and it approaches it from the other angle. It's, it's very theoretical, but it was looking at the system. You know, how would someone who isn't an architect design a house for themselves if they don't understand some of the underlying, uh, you know, professional expertise, I guess, for doing that. And so even in the 60s, he had this kind of cool retro concept that he called the flat writer, where it was this sort of glyph-like physical typewriter that would actually stamp out uh, kind of coded pixels like a like a computer punch card that would act as a sort of blueprint that you could hand to someone who's you know, engaging in a, in a self-built architecture project and they could you know sort of keep everyone within the constraints of the system but actually design things that are new um, which also i think has a bunch of really really interesting concepts built into that but it was theoretical and there was never really a physical system to connect it to and so nothing was ever realized you know beyond the drawings and so the the place that i sort of inserted the research that i did was you know taking all of that conceptual background, now that we have computers and the internet and actual ways to disseminate information like this and to, to build collaborative platforms, what would it look like to take a, a constrained kit system and make an interface that someone who isn't an architect could actually potentially use? Uh, so I built kind of two things. One was the, the neural network side of the project, the, the actual prediction algorithms. And the second was uh, kind of a prototype for an interface. Um, so this is kind of a, a small preview. I'm going to show the other back end first, but the, this is the final product. Um, it's a JavaScript 3JS interface where uh, you can drag the zones and essentially define an area that then an algorithm will fill back in with some kind of prediction for how an architect might program the space kind of based on the data that it's seen before. But before we dive into that, I'm gonna look a little bit kind of further into you know, how the neural network can actually understand a thing. Uh, so Jose Luis talked about this a little bit um, and uh, usually in these lectures, everyone has some version of like the number handwritten data set. Um, but the thing that was kind of a light bulb moment for me was that the, you know, the way that someone who knows how to read sees a number and recognizes what it is, is something that you never really lose. You know, if you, if you learn what a four is, you can look at most things that are supposed to be a four and, and, and sort of classify that for yourself. The way that that works for a neural network is that it has to see many, many examples of things that are fours and understand them at a much more granular level to be able to reliably do that kind of at scale. And so there's this, this kind of shared process in, you know, image algorithms or in image neural networks where we're taking input data and they're breaking it down into lots of little tiny pieces and sort of understanding, you know, adjacency relationships about what's happening, you know, from this pixel to this pixel on all sides and, and then kind of mapping windows across the entire object. Um, and after doing that, you know, lots and lots of times you, you sort of build up this kind of innate understanding that's totally unique to just the way that neural networks operate. And so at the lowest level, you know, this is what, when, you know, you consider uh, an algorithm seeing an image, this is sort of what it sees. 
So that nine is really distributed of values from zero to one. And when you're putting something in and getting something out, you're just getting a, an equally sized prediction that is a different matrix of, of zero to one. Um, so kind of building this back up into fix to fix, the things that, that we're using, it's just essentially this concept stacked into three layers, which is just RGB values. Uh, so an image of essentially anything you can imagine can be kind of interpreted in this way. It's just splitting it into channels, looking at it purely as numbers, and then learning relationships about, you know, mapping image you know, A to image B, um, or really in whatever order you want. And so the, you know, a lot of what I was looking into was also strongly influenced by Jose Luis and Nono because they were looking at some of the stuff around the time that I was at the GSD. Um, and in addition to the stuff that I learned from them, there was this example that's now super well known, kind of associated with the, the Pix to Pix project, that's this facades experiment. And so what's happening here is that they have a hand tagged data set. So someone has gone over a bunch of pictures of elevations of, I, I think it's Google Street View data, uh, but they've gone over it with sort of a tagging tool and they've drawn colorized zones that represent, you know, what types of architectural elements represent these things on the building. Um, and what's interesting here is that this actually isn't training data. This is what comes out of the network. So these are pictures of buildings that don't exist, sort of imagined by the neural network. And so when I was you know, thinking about what the, the logic, kind of the system behind my, my drawing interface could be, um, I was originally imagining it would be something more procedural, you know, something more like a grasshopper script. Uh, but once I was exposed to these sorts of you know, applications of creative machine learning, I decided to sort of pivot and see if you could convert this concept into something that worked with floor plans. So for the experiments that I did, the, the high level kind of process was, you know, start with a batch of houses that sort of look like the, the type and size of, of plans that I was hoping to generate, build up a data set from scratch. Um, and then the, the end result, the way that someone would interact with the model is then fill in a, a solid region that just represents the, the site plan or the, the kind of zone to fill with rooms. And the neural network would then give back some prediction that would be some Kind of combination of the, the examples that it had seen. Um, so in, a, in an abstract way, it's you know based on all the houses that I've looked at before, this is how we think an architect would divide up this space, assuming that you know the houses that it's been trained on were initially designed by architects or, or someone who was a professional. The, the other thing that's changed dramatically just in the two years since I was doing this which sounds weird because that's like not a long period of time, but in machine learning time, that's like a decade. Uh, there was really no publicly available data sets for floor plans. Uh, someone asked in the chat earlier. Um, there, there's one now, like a large one that I'm aware of called Cubicasa. Um, but just for the type of data that I knew I was looking for, there really wasn't anything out there. So uh, I ended up building one from scratch, um, which wasn't as terrible as it sounds. It was like two or three days and like a lot of coffee, but I ended up with this data set of about 110 floor plans that then with some augmentation and um, you know, kind of creative Python trickery ended up being about three or 400 houses. Um, I'll kind of buzz through the, the process of that. So for building up the data set, you know, this is an example of like one kind of raw image I got from Google. I, I found a bunch of different websites that have house plans. Um, so it's a combination of stuff, um, but essentially I was looking for single story, one bedroom houses. And the idea was that, you know, the, the model space is sort of bounded to a certain scale. And then to make the, the predictions as accurate as possible, I made sure all the data sort of fell within that scale as well. Um, so all the houses are usually within like kind of a 40 to 40 foot bounding box and represent like usually within a like fewer than three or fewer bedroom house that would normally exist in the, in the US. So the scraped image, uh, it starts at kind of a random scale. Um, and the, the time intensive process was essentially going in there, actually reading the drawings or reading the drawings to find the scale and then actually scaling these into world space. Uh, so I was using Rhino. Um, and I, if you're interested, actually, I have the model and all of the tagging data in the, the Git repo that we'll share later. Um, but the process was kind of getting all of the data into a, a shared uniform scale. And the function of that is that at the end, when training the model, you know, all of the even at once it's been rasterized and it's an image and kind of no longer a drawing, the 
the pixels still represent some kind of real world approximation of, of space. So bigger houses that take up more pixels actually have more rooms and the, the network actually kind of learns the relationship between you know, the number of separate objects and the, the size of the space that you're filling. And so once everything was scaled, um, it was just drawing rooms, kind of color tagging everything. Uh, I made some extra kind of experimental representations. Uh, and actually at the time, I didn't really do anything with this. Um, but one of the new experiments that we did in the past month actually overlaid these two things to kind of create room separation that actually produced kind of totally different interesting results. And then the, you know, the input data set here, so these are your A images and these are your B images. Um, and that's the, the kind of the pair that we then use to generate uh, new predictions. The, the color palette was not a design decision. Uh, this is also common to a lot of like image-based kind of prediction projects that you'll see. The, the idea here is that you know, the, the colors are as far apart from one another and on the spectrum as possible. Since you know, these things will get mapped from integer 255 value pixels down to a space of zero to one, the, that flattening process, there's some loss. And so the idea is that if the, the colors are kind of equidistant, if you can imagine them on a color spectrum, the, the network will get confused when, when predicting if you know, a pixel is this type or this type. So this was the results of like one of the first models that I trained. Um, and I think the, you know, the takeaway that I had after this project was that like, like a neural network isn't a very good architect, but it's a really fun tool to play with if you want to explore designs in a way that, that you don't normally do. So it, it, you know, I wouldn't recommend anyone like go like build the next like holistic modeling platform with pics to pics in the background. Like I, I don't think it's like that's the takeaway from any of this stuff, but it, it is a super interesting kind of mode of, of designing and then working with, uh, working with constraints that's totally unique to, to machine learning. And what I find really cool about, you know, actually kind of looking into the results and seeing what's happening here is that sometimes they make a lot of sense. Sometimes they don't make any sense at all. Um, but you can sort of fill that middle space with, you know, human intuition. And so as you, as you place more objects and kind of lock in more of the system, the, the algorithm usually gets kind of smarter about then how to make the next decision in the chain. You know, so for this one, you know, the, the training image was that there's a bedroom here, a hallway, two bathrooms, a kitchen, and then a large deck area. The prediction for that same shape was a gigantic closet on the top, um, a huge kitchen, a deck in a place that makes sense, but you still got a bedroom and the bedroom has closets and everything's like walkable. So it, I'm, I'm always just interested. So as, as you draw things that either are similar to what the model is seen, or if you draw things that are, you know, nowhere near what the model is seen, it'll still occasionally or actually can often do something that is still functionally workable as, as, a, as an architectural plan, um, but it doesn't know what's a good plan. And so that's kind of where human intuition still comes back in and there's, there's the need for a, a feedback loop. And so these are some you know, totally imagined shapes, you know, some kind of intentionally drawing things that the, the network hasn't seen before and, and seeing what happens. So this is what the, the interface looked like. So on the, you know, kind of stepping back from the back end, the, the intention of the project was that, you know, the user doesn't really interact with the model in that way. You know, they, they kind of are influenced by what the model is doing, um, but see it in this more kind of cleaned up uh, representation. Um, this, you know, is kind of half prototype, you know, prototypical The you know, as you could tell with some of the images, you know, there's a huge variety of how noisy or, or high quality the, the data out of it is. So the, the process of actually interpreting that data automatically and cleaning it up and then building clean geometry like this is like, it probably at least as hard as doing the, the ML work in the first place. Um, so this is, you know, these representations are sort of aspirational or that they were at the time. Um, but the, the concept is that, you know, you could use, uh, you know, a machine intelligence like, like a neural network to take the constraints that someone may have, you know, so it could be, you know, I have a lot that has the shape that's very atypical and would require the, the expertise of an architect um, and instead see what you can sort of synthesize from, from the model. Oh shoot, okay, this is on.
Can you guys see my YouTube screen? Cool. Um, and this was another sort of demo I put together back at the time. And the idea is that, you know, so even if you can't get the perfect answer every time, which no one really expected, but when sort of presenting things in this way and you talk about automating any kind of, you know, manual process when you do it and then you say like, well, no, this doesn't really fix it. You still have to do some of the work yourself, but usually, you know, people are confused by that. Um, but I, I always thought it was sort of interesting this, again, this kind of new potential way of engaging with these models where it might solve 80% of my problem, or it might give me an idea to, to approach the problem in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. And then you can, you know, you as the, the human user at the end can then interpret the results and sort of fill in that last 20%, 10%. Um, so this is, you know, kind of an especially noisy output that I picked. And instead of saying like, oh, you know, this one's no good, I'm going to look for something else in the design space that's more, more clean or interpretable, you could instead say, well, I'm actually just going to use this as, as an underlay and, and trace over it and kind of fill in the gaps for the model. Um, and that's kind of what closes this, the, the idea of the feedback loop. But yeah, so yeah, the user would draw in their, their shape, whatever it is, and then they could use the, the tools that are built into the front end to, to trace over it and eventually end up at something that they could kind of take on to the next phase of the design process in theory. Is there anything in the, the chat? I don't know, Jose Luis, that questions or anything? There are some questions. Um, you, you may want to open it up for five minutes to answer questions. I've been responding to some questions that have been. OK. Um, I think, well, yeah, so this was, yeah, this was my last slide. Um, somebody was asking, somebody was confused about when you showed the slide where you had the, floor, the A, B, and the prediction. Somebody mm -hmm. was a little, people were a little confused about what was the input, what was the output, and what was the, what was, so. The oh, sorry, yeah, that probably was super clear. Front. Yeah. If you can clarify that a little bit. So the, the actual image pairs, so for the, the model that was generating those underlay predictions, and the, the ones that I showed, the A image, you know, the, the input image was the black infill, and then the B image is the tagged colors. Um, well, and actually, as I say that, the you can you can tell the model to train either way. It, it's not, the, the the directionality isn't really important. You just you tell it to go B to A or A to B. So it, if you're thinking of the facade, sort of as an example, the you know the relationship is the same. Um, so the the color tagged image is the the input, and then this is the actual training pair. So if, I, if I'm going to draw uh, a shape and I want a prediction, it's going to convert that, that shape into an image that, that looks like this one here. It'll, it'll just be white pixels with a black infill, and then the pix to pix model will process that black and white image, and it'll output you know, the, the kind of predictive matrix that has some you know, idea of what the room program would be. There was, um, somebody was asking also about data augmentation and about the idea of flipping and rotating images to. Yeah, so that's, um, I think even in the, just the entry Google pix to pix uh, demo collab notebook, they are, they're doing some of that in there. Um, the GitHub repo, which are at the end also has the code that I wrote for doing that. There's a kind of a nice library for, for doing that in Python. It's, I, most of the pix to pix examples I've seen do some version of that. And mostly it's just a strategy for kind of um, generalizing the, the data set and to avoid overfitting. Um, and it, it, you know, probably it does or doesn't make sense in some context based on like what types of images you're, you're training on. But for, you know, this example, it doesn't really matter. You know, even if I mirror or rotate this, this floor plan or the representation of it, it's it's still a valid floor plan. You know, you can you can take the house and you know the doors will still work and the rooms are correct to one another adjacent. Um, 
And I think, yeah, yeah so it, it worked well for me to do that, but it, it might not in all cases. Yeah, imagine, so for example, if we're going to see some data sets now of flowers. So in a data set of flowers, if you have a flower picture, so it makes sense that the tail is at the bottom of the image and then the flower is maybe at the center or on the top. So that's what the model will learn. If you would like to have the model also learn maybe pictures that are flipped where the tail is on the top and the image is on the bottom, you will have to do augmentation in, in the sense of rotating the image, right? So in the data set, you have normal images and then images are rotated. So it's about, as Nate's saying, uh, not having the model overfit, which is just learning the patterns that are only on your data set and trying to augment it with more, you know, more types of inputs. Um, so, so the question Andrew here. is asking how large your training set was. Um, so the, the number of like original unique plans that I tagged was 104, I think. Um, I had like 125, 130 images, and then there was just, you know, once you get up close and realize that some are bad, you end up kind of cutting some out. So I think the actual set was like 104. Mm -hmm. Which is a very slow, it's, it's a very low number for training. Right. And, and I think it works. Well, I guess you can decide if it works or not. I thought it worked, but the, it worked in this context uh, because the, you know, the the variety of of plans in a at a high level is really small, right? It's like you're not showing it hospitals and offices and mansions and tiny houses. It's like a very you know kind of a narrow range of architectural style. And even within that, you know, I think the just based on what you can find, you know, images of on the internet, it kind of trends towards like you know contemporary modular houses. And so e even within that, I think it's a pretty small range. Um, I think now I mean, one of the things that I was realizing recently is that now that again, the tools have gotten so much better and it's easier to train these things. It would be interesting to see how far you can push the scaling of this. Um, you know, I still, I, I think the biggest limit is probably the, the spatial constraints, the, you know, the fact that there has to be, at least in my mind, there has to be some relationship when using images between like the amount of space in a, in a relative sense. And so it'd be difficult to train a model that accounts for both hospitals and houses of this size. Um, but at the same time, you know, this stuff is under very active <laughs> development and improvement. And I'm sure something mm -hmm. cool will happen relatively soon.